share it with your Smith network. Um, feel free to do that. Um, and before we get started, I would love to just have everybody kind of type in the chat box where they're joining us from. And while you, you do that, I will um, announce our presenter. So um, in experience design, Leah Fallon, uh, class of 01, found a perfect outlet for her right and left brain combo of intellect, empathy, and curiosity. As a creative director and strategist, her work has included agency life and consultancy for Fortune 500 films, startups, and musical acts. In 2011, she founded her own firm, 1111 Creative. Um, Malice Grant, uh, graduated 01J, is a career marketing professional with 15 years of experience in the fields of music, educational travel, business development, and data management. She is a co-founder of Sounds Essential, LLC, a brand and data management firm that specializes in outfitting businesses with the right tools to work more efficiently. So thank you both for being here today, and um, you can take it from here. All right. Malice, you ready? Uh, I am, but I always let you go first. <laughs> uh, oh, go ahead. No, you. No, I just wanted to say hello to everybody. And um, as we uh, sort of get started here, I do want to just reiterate what uh, Lindsay was saying in that um, we, we, uh, we encourage class participation. So just type any questions that you might have or any comments or, you know, if you think you're incredibly funny, we take that too. So just type it into the chat box and uh, away we'll go. So away we go. Um, so one of the commonalities between uh, both Malice's and my work, even though it is in essence very different, is that in starting our own firms, we both started to work from home more consistently. And at this point, we are entirely based out of our home offices. What we wanted to do in looking at this presentation is think about not just those who are self-employed and work from home exclusively, but also just thinking about some of the dynamics of leaving a structured office environment if your company has a work from home or a flexible policy. So hopefully what we've done is put together a presentation that applies broadly to the rules of the road for what it means to work outside of a structured office and looks at the dynamics of how even though you're not in an office ultimately the expectations maintain themselves at kind of the same caliber so when you're in an office structure if you decide to or are able to work outside of it there are a lot of the same rules that apply and trying to master the different environment and still working with that same uh, dynamic of people and tools etc is really the what makes or breaks your success in this space and so as we've gone through this, we've looked at a couple things that really do apply more specifically to different of those groups, whether or not you're full time and you know at a company and work remotely, or if you have your own shop and kind of move around. So we'll point those out as they come through, but really what we've tried to do is look at some general rules of the road that make sense of this mess and take the idea of getting out of the structure into a structure that can make sense for you and make you successful. And ultimately, working from home, we have found was, and what we were talking about before this, this presentation began, can be a challenge in terms of adjustment, but it's an awesome opportunity. And it's a really great way to actually develop a, a really interesting lifestyle and kind of a freedom of, and a way of working that both of us find very fulfilling. It's just a matter of mastery of a couple of those rules and a little bit of adaptation to find the right tools. And as we say, tips and tricks to help you be successful and make the best use of your time time and make sure that you guard that time judiciously. Absolutely. And um, these are just a couple of ideas that we have come together, as Leah said, but we do encourage you all to, as we go through this, to share your own ideas. Um, you know, obviously some of what we've run into will be specific to us and to our situations, and there will be different things that apply to people in other fields or in other, you know, structural environments, that kind of thing. So as we go through this, please don't be shy. Like I said, class participation, just type whatever you'd like into the chat box and um, we will try and get to all of the questions or um, announce all of those uh, as we can. And we will also, at the end of this, um, if there are other ideas and tips and tricks and tools that you share with us, we'll make sure that that all gets collected um, so that uh, in one place, so that everybody can have a, a resource to refer back to. Um, just really quickly, as we start to go through this, I'd like to invite everyone to use the chat window to let us know sort of what your current situation is. Maybe you're already working from home. Um, maybe you are in a situation where one day a week, like Lindsay, you're allowed to, but maybe 
for whatever reason you find that you can't or you don't or you want, won't, or maybe it's something that you're thinking about starting out on your own, but the idea of leaving the structure and the expectations that are somewhat comforting of a structure offers environment um, seem really daunting to you. And so maybe that's where you are in your journey. Um, we're welcoming uh, all input from all sides of that. And uh, it's also okay to be scared to death about this. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that you will always be scared or that it is quite that scary, but it's okay to feel that way jumping into it. Um, and keeping that, so with that in mind, we're just going to give you a little bit of an idea about how we're going to structure this. Um, the first section of the presentation, we're going to talk specifically about tips and tricks. Um, those two things are together because sometimes the line between the two is so blurry as to be um, unrecognizable. But we're going to deal with time management. Um, communications and collaboration, financials, and then a little something we like to call personal business. Personal. <laughs> it's personal. <laughs> so the first category here, and I think, you know, as, as working people, always the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, the balance between time and money. And for us, we wanted to start with time because as you work from home, it becomes a, a great matter. You People can't see you anymore. So it's a matter of how you participate in the conversation and how you set up your days. You no longer have a commute. You no longer have conversations in the hallway. So it takes a little bit different look at how it is you set up your clock. So one thing that it's important to do is to keep a calendar. Um, you don't have someone who can wheel by you and say, hey, by the way, we're supposed to go here. It's important to know where you're supposed to be, maintain that judiciously, make sure that you know that that balances both your personal and your professional um, obligations, but make sure that you keep a very tight calendar and it's very intimately related to the next subject, which is about keeping track of your time. Because again, you are not in a circumstance where your colleagues can see you on Facebook <laughs> if you're sneaking away at your computer to uh, check the messages. They also can't see that you're actively on a phone call or engaged in a meeting. And sometimes it becomes a little bit of a blur as to what you did during the course of the day when it really is a series of hours at the computer and hours on the telephone. So it's important if your company doesn't have a time tracking system that, that you log into, or if it doesn't have a very sophisticated one, for your own self, keep track of your time. That helps you in reporting back with communications with your team or with your management structure, or if you're on the freelance side or you know, do a different work structure, it helps you manage your billing and understand how it is you, you spent your time and where you put it. It's a very important thing to do, and those two pieces kind of work together. The next is about blocking your time, and this is what becomes important, just about guarding your hours and your ability to get work done, and also your ability to maintain your personal life. One thing that becomes an undercurrent in this presentation, and that certainly is, is part, you know, part and parcel of working from home, is the word home is in it. And as you try to make a separation between your work life and your life life, it's important that you not get up in the morning and immediately go to your computer before you've had coffee at 5 a.m. It's important that you're not there still at midnight all the time by default. It's also important that you give yourself the ability to actually get work done because the manner in which you'll communicate with people is now through the telephone and through you know, in digital channels. It's important not to look at blocking your calendar off so that you have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, but put in time for you actually to maintain your productivity and to get done the things that are generated on those phone calls that you need to do. And then another underscoring part of this is the idea of making a routine. Um, Malice always laughs when we get to this part of the presentation because this is not a talent of mine, but it is an ambition. <laughs> and the, the hope here is that you give yourself whatever tools it takes for you to go through the day and feel that you're maintaining a work structure. For some people, that's get up and make a breakfast. For some people, it's get up, take a shower, and put on work clothes. Make for some bed. people. Make the bed, right? Malice is the bed. But whatever it is it takes for you to make a routine and stick to it is an important part of keeping yourself sane in this process when you get out of that structured work environment. Um, and then here's the thing that nobody ever actually tells you about this. Or, and I think this, uh, we were actually talking with Lindsay a little bit about this before everybody hopped on. Um, you can take lunch, even if you're working from home. Even if nobody can see you, even if it seems like all of the uh, 
all of the things you've got to do, or it's just so easy to grab the sandwich downstairs and then go back upstairs to your office and sit at your desk and eat while you read emails or field phone calls or that kind of thing. Not only can you take lunch, you absolutely should. Um, so that's part of blocking your time. Uh, you need to block the time to get away just as much as you block the time <laughs> to be there and to be present. And sort of following up on that is leaving the house. And I don't mean just for work-related meetings. Um, so uh, just a, a little bit of a personal anecdote. Uh, my husband and I moved to the mountains of North Carolina after 10 years of living in New York City and all of the hustle and bustle that that entailed. And we worked from home and we worked together. Um, and after, I forget when it was, but somewhere around the six month mark of, of establishing our firm and walk, working from home, I looked up one day and realized that I had not left the house in three days. Um, and that was just a real gut punch to me uh, of self-realization. Um, I'm not happy if I don't talk to other people. I start to get insular and isolated. Um, and it's just for your own well-being to leave the house. It's also for your health. You should, you should breathe some fresh air every once in a while and get some exercise. But you'll be amazed at what it does for your productivity too when you realize just a little bit. If you're like me, I'm one of those people where I can sit and stare at a problem and it just will, the solution will elude me for hours. And I get up and I go and I do something else and 15 minutes later, it's like a light bulb went off because my brain has had some time to rest and to just sort of you know, ponder on things. Um, so taking lunch and leaving the house, those spaces and those times where you're not working are just as important as those when you are. And to Malice's point, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but because you no longer have a commute, it's important to give yourself that type of time and distance away from the work, the machine, whatever it is, in order to, to refresh yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So our next section, but first we'll pause and see any questions about managing your time. For me, this, this was always, remains the, the biggest one. And this is the place where I have to put the most active and most mindful effort. Are there any questions or any, any observations from anybody who's in the same boat? Um, we haven't had many questions yet in the chat, but a couple of people have shared, um, have shared some of their experiences and, um, just to speak to that, um, and we do have a question. Uh, we will get to a whole bunch of tools that we recommend for each of these uh, challenges. And we're gonna do that sort of all together at the end of the presentation. Um, and we're also gonna speak to some of the concerns that you guys shared about you know, your potential work from home or your potential remote working possibilities. So. All right, great. So the next big part of this is communication. And, you know, money comes next, comes next. <laughs> in thinking about communications, again, because you are no longer having face-to-face -face interaction with people, it's important to understand the balance of when and how to be present. And this is a matter of choosing the correct tools. And it's also back to that question of, of blocking your time and balancing your calendar. So the first, of course, is to be responsive because people cannot see you. It's important to let them know that you're there. It's important to be part of that conversation. And when we get into the tools conversation, we'll talk a little bit about more about mediums for how to be responsive and what that means. But it does raise the question of choosing your medium. As you look at the tools available to you, some of your, you know, your companies or your teams may have different tools than, than sort of the basics of you know, phone, email, and in person. But in thinking about a challenge, it's important to choose your medium wisely. Some things are appropriate for email. Some are more appropriate for phone calls. Phone calls obviously bring a personal touch with the sound of your voice that an email does not. Some things require a little bit more complex negotiation than can be done over email. Things that need to be on the record need to go in email. So as you think about being responsive, think about the medium that best serves your goal and what it is you need to accomplish and keep. To the point of adding a personal touch, because you're gone, it's important to remind people that you are a person. Right? So whether or not it's if not you just a chat but <laughs> exactly, exactly. So if you're working primarily over email or if you're sending files digitally, it is nice just 
to pick up the phone and have a phone call with someone at some point. It's also nice if you, you know, particularly if you're a freelancer to send handwritten notes, but just to keep kind of a human touch attached to things so that we don't become, you know, an AI monster at the other end of a screen. And then of course, managing email. There are a lot of different ways to do this, and we're going to talk about um, organization in a little bit, but it, it is a question of thinking about how it is you store your email, whether or not you do things like, say, reply all. This goes back to the question of thinking about choosing your medium and thinking about how it is you manage your inbox because it will be the place where you spend more time. Certainly understanding how you want to approach it to filter what's urgent, what does require action, and what's simply informational has to do with how you file that and it has to do with how you respond to things, whether or not reply all is appropriate, whether or not you read an email and pick up the phone or whether or not you continue to respond in that way. Uh, and to sort of further elaborate on that, um, I have spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, Leah interacts um, very frequently on a day-to-day -day basis all day long with other people. Um, we primarily are a, a digital service-based company, um, and I have clients that I've had for more than three years that I've never, I couldn't pick them out of a lineup, and I've never heard their voice on the phone. Um, and some of that's because of where they are located. I have clients all over the world. Um, some of that's because they find us to perform a digital service and so therefore the expectation from their end is that we're not necessarily human um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's fine um, my feelings aren't hurt but just a little bit um, but one of the things that i have spent a lot of time doing is trying to figure out what the rules for uh, managing that glut of email that is the primary source of my communication and that I, I probably do as much email all day long as Leah spins on the phone, which is, <laughs> is a, a ridiculous lot. amount. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so the first thing that I've, that I've sort of happened upon as a really good uh, trick is uh, when to respond. So timing is everything. Um, I've gotten very possessive of my time of late and um, to the point where I put our business hours in the signature of my email. So anyone who receives an email from me, you know, it's, it's kind of small and unobtrusive and it's in the bottom, but it says Sounds Essentials normal business hours are nine to five Monday through Friday. If, you know, if it's an emergency, this is how, this is what you need to do. But that helps set up the expectation and just let people know what my working blocks are. Um, and then what the bad habit I had to break myself of is actually keeping my response to those hours as well. So it's all good and well to tell someone that you're open from nine to five, but if they send you an email at eight the night before and you respond to them at 6 a.m. the next morning before they even get back into the office, you're setting unreasonable expectations about how quick you might potentially turn things around. And then that also starts to eat into the time that they will allow you to actually get work done. Um, so a good rule of thumb for me is you can, and you can draft all you want. The draft function should become your best friend. Um, but if you're working at 10 o'clock at night, you shouldn't actually tell other people you're working at 10 o'clock at night. Unless it's an emergency situation, obviously circumstances will vary. Um, but, you know, it's completely okay to reclaim that time and to not let people know that occasionally you slip. Um, the other thing, obviously, and this is just basic sort of email etiquette a little bit, is to, re to reply or reply all only when it's actually required of you. And I know that that can be really hard um, to determine because other people don't necessarily follow the same rules. But technically, if you're CC'd or BCC'd, then you just need to read it and keep it moving. Um, you know, maybe make a note to yourself or flag the email for follow up in case something comes back. Um, your CYA move in that moment is to read it, to, to know what the content is, but not necessarily to um, get involved. Um, and that will, you'll find at the end of the day that if you sort of stick to that, as a hard and fast rule, you'll spend a lot less time shuttling email back and forth. Um, and then finally, I, it's what I call the golden rule of email, send unto others when you'd have them send unto you. So uh, <laughs> don't email somebody in a situation when you wouldn't want 
them to email you or if you were in that same situation. So it's always just sort of looking into a mirror, putting yourself personally into the receiving end. And you'll find that as you develop these habits, people will sort of internalize them on their end. And it's not actually that long before you stop getting emailed <laughs> after, you know, eight o'clock at night or something like that. Um, and then in terms of how to respond, the, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Um, we're all professional people. We've all been dealing with email on a day-to-day basis, although I'm sure we've all had those emails where you're just like, really? <laughs> a, did you need to say that? Or B, are you sure you meant to say it that way? <laughs> um, so one of the, the key things, first and foremost, is to keep it professional. Um, I think we all know this, but tone gets lost in translation. Um, even if somebody is hilarious in person, they may not necessarily be able to communicate that in an effective or even in remotely the same way across email. Um, so save your personality uh, for when you're having one-on-one -on -one email conversations um, or, you know, just for, for other venues, other mediums. Um, this is a, a nifty little trick. Um, if anybody's ever been on the wrong end of the never ending email chain um, and then been required to go back and try and figure out when some person was talking about this one thing four weeks ago, um, manage your subjects. Uh, I do this all the time and I've never had any kickback from it. When I see the subject of an email chain has started to change, I will change the subject line when I'm replying. Um, I keep the email chain intact underneath, but just to the point where people understand that we're at, the conversation has shifted, um, and that will also help you get responses back in a more timely fashion. Um, I find that particularly with people who have nested conversation organization for their emails, um, quite honestly, they just lose emails because it always looks like the same thing. So just change the subject line. You could even just put the date in it. Um, any small change will help you keep organized and, and be able to you know, go back later and, and reference it. Um, the other thing that I do uh, is to set expectations up front. And by that, I mean, if I, if I want a response or a particular reaction to an email, um, then I will put that in the subject line. So if I want you to review it, I will say for review. Um, or response needed, or approval required. Um, and that also helps people on the other end, you know, know that it's, it's kind of important or that, that there is a timeliness to the email. And so you're not sitting around waiting on a response from somebody that it would have taken two seconds if they had known that what they needed to do was just type the word yes and hit send. Um, and then finally, in as few words as possible, we all know that nobody reads. We all also are probably up against needing to cover our rear ends and so wanting to make sure that everything is on paper so that we have that paper trail. That's valid. <laughs> I won't say it's not valid. I am certainly fall victim to that. Um, but if you do find that you have to write more than a paragraph, do know that nobody's gonna read much beyond the first and that you should probably pick up the phone. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's all I got on that. <laughs> Pardon any questions? Any questions? Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> so we promised we promised the money was coming. So you mind it, so it's not constantly on your mind. Just a couple things here, and this starts to get into a little bit more specialized territory. But um, in thinking about expense accounts, because they do in fact still exist. If you have a company, if you, if you work within a company structure, this is an important thing to establish because as you work from home, the type of expenses that you incur are no longer, oh, I needed, you know, food for a meeting, right? As you start to look, you know, or, or you know, you, you no longer go through the office manager to get a stapler, right? You have to start looking at what, what makes sense in terms of managing your home office and, and what that means in terms of your company's expense policy. So it's one thing that's important to clarify up front if you're going to set up a home office in a slightly more regular capacity, if you're on staff with someone to understand, are they gonna pay for your light bulbs? Are they gonna pay for your pencils? Is this an expense that, that becomes part of your responsibility or theirs? 
But if it is yours, it's important to take a look at with, an, with your accountant how it is to account for those expenses. So it doesn't become extra money that goes down the drain. It's towards a specific end. And so it's important to keep track of those expenses, both with the company that you're employed with or on your own, whether or not you're freelance or not, to be able to account for those at the end. That can also include things like subscriptions. That can include you know, apportioning with your taxes for home use, like the square footage of a home office for your power bill. It can be your cable bill. It can be any kinds of things, depending on your profession. So it's important to take a look at this um, very critically to understand what your company might cover and also what of the cost of working from home starts to get wrapped in to the terrible tax discussion we all have. And now, all the single ladies. <laughs> Let's sing with me. Leah sings better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> we're not being gen gender exclusionary, just uh, we just thought that was funny. Um, but for people who are freelancers or who work for themselves, um, finances take on a little bit of a different shape. Actually, they take on a drastically different shape. Um, and there, are, I, I just, I can't stress enough how important it is to uh, establish good habits in terms of managing your money, um, sort of right from the beginning. Um, so that, you know, come tax time next year, you're not digging through shoeboxes for receipts or um, trying to remember which half of that target receipt was for business and which half was for personal, that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, what counts as an expense um, when you're self-employed or when you're um, a freelancer uh, also can be a little more broad ranging than if you're simply working from home for a larger organization or company. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's different ways to go about it, but depending on the industry you're in, for example, I do a lot with media and uh, with content creation, and it is perfectly legitimate for me <laughs> to uh, write off, say, Hulu as an expense account. Um, <laughs> as a, or as an expense. Uh, so you just really want to make sure that you're, you're, you're not shooting yourself in the foot, but do know that you have a little bit more leniency with what ends up counting as an expense and what doesn't. Um, you know, your subscriptions, if, if you're someone whose job it is to, uh, if you're an accountant, um, and financial, reading Financial Times is something that helps you do your job better, that subscription is a business expense. So anything that you can tie back directly to either keeping current in your particular field um, or, you know, improving the way that you work in your field, that also can count. Um, but also it's important to know that you shouldn't get too creative. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, we're not asking, we're not telling anybody to, to be illegal or to, to make false, false claims. Um, but there are some tools out there specifically that it's important to know um, that they exist and that there are rules that you do need to follow. Uh, Leah mentioned apportioning the home use or the use of your home as your business expense. And there are two, um, two methods by which you can do that. And those are pretty much the only two methods. It's the area method or the number of rooms method. Um, and you can look up either one of those and, and find, them, um, find them relatively easily. Um, the other thing that I always tell people to beware of, we were just talking about um, subscriptions. Uh, it's great to get that intro deal where it's like 95% off the cover price or it's a year for a dollar, um, but it is automatically going to renew at the full price. And if you're using this for any kind of budgeting purposes, you just wanna keep that on your radar that come, come next year, you're gonna see probably a significant jump um, in whatever that particular line item is. And the last thing that I wanna say as far as accounting by the book is concerned, um, is that there have been a lot of recent tax changes that have a significant effect on what you can claim um, on your taxes for business purposes, um, particularly if, if it's uh, expenses that don't get reimbursed to you by your company, but you were planning on just claiming them on your taxes. Um, I'm not a tax expert, so I won't I won't go into specific details other than to let you know that that has changed and it is something that you need to be aware of. Uh, 
Dom. I'm going to let Leah take the rates and billing because I think Leah, that's more. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. And just, you know, a couple, a couple rules of the road here. I mean, it's important to understand if you're going to bill yourself out to, to know what you'll do and what you won't do. A couple great rules of the road are to have a standard hourly or day rate and then to be prepared to be flexible with that. Say if you are offered a project rate, et cetera. So start to understand how much it takes for you to do work and how much you're willing to accept for it. With the knowledge that as a freelancer, you pay all your own taxes. So your rates will be higher than someone if they were to, you know, employ someone, you know, on staff to do it. But just look at what, what it takes for you to get work done and what it is you're comfortable accepting. Back to the idea of calendars and tracking your time. Here, it's most critical to track your time and understand what you're putting into things. Not only does that help you refine your own estimates of what work will take, but it also helps you support the argument if you need to report in halfway to say, this is taking more work than we originally agreed to, and here's why. Um, so it becomes a conversation with, with your clients about that. Um, and just a couple of important things is just say no to spec work. You know, if you're good at something, never do it for free. And the whole idea of being a freelancer is that you're good at something. So don't do it for free. Um, there are, you know, a couple moments where you can work with people, especially in trying to obtain clients to do brainstorming or to offer samples of things, but doing things on spec becomes a terrible trap and you end up working very, very hard without being paid. And no matter what, just remember that, you, you know, your time is money as a, <laughs> as a person who works for yourself. Um, make sure that you protect yourself in terms of that. Make sure that contracts are in place so that you don't do work without agreements about payment, that you understand how it is you're going to get paid, that you understand full questions and scope so that you can accurately estimate your work, et cetera. And then always remember to factor in, you know, meetings, travel, because when you're working from home, you aren't in an office, you know, environment. So keep track of your tolls, keep track of that time, make sure that you are uh, looking at the, the big picture. And uh, I would just, uh, to tack onto that, uh, your time is money and your knowledge has value. And don't ever sell yourself short on that. Um, I'm, I'm always mindful of what I call the accidental consultant trap, which is um, someone recognizes that you know what you're talking about and in, attempting to protect perhaps land a project or get business you spend a lot of time answering questions or you know fielding emails or fielding phone calls and before you know it you've given away at least a, a decent amount of both your time and your knowledge for free before a payment agreement is, is made um, and so it's you know, it, it can start to feel a little bit like a cat and mouse game of, well, you tell me this and I'll tell you if I'll, pay, you tell me how much it's going to cost and I'll tell you if I'll pay it or, you know, it's, it's just one of those things, but don't ever sell yourself short. It's okay when somebody picks up the phone, if it's the 10th phone call and they've asked you 12,000 different questions, you can just say, I would love to talk about this with you further. Why don't we talk about what a consulting agreement would look like? Great. And then Mal, you want to talk about buying to spec? I, I get weak here. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, uh, contrary to working for spec, um, buying to spec is something that's really important. Um, my husband and I both work in the tech industry and a lot of what we do ends up involving um, making sure that people have um, the, the right equipment um, to do the job. And it's really important to inventory what you need. Um, everybody, you know, knows that they probably need a computer or a laptop of some kind. Um, but maybe you do a lot of graphic work and so a MacBook Air is not necessarily going to meet all of your needs. Yes, it's going to be more expensive to buy a full CPU tower or whatever. Um, but you'll find that if you have the right tools for the job, you'll spend a lot less time trying to find workarounds for tools that you don't have to get a job done that you still need to do. Um, so, you know, pay an inventory for what you need and pay as much as you can. Um, it's really hard, particularly if you're just starting out or if you've got a really, really tight budget to uh, feel like you're splurging on something, maybe, you know, a computer that has more RAM or a program that is maybe more advanced than the one that you're already using, but you do already have something. It can start to feel like maybe you're, you're, you're splurging or you're making unnecessary purchases, but an important thing to do is to sort of sit down and realize how much time you would regain 
if you were to invest a little bit more in a better tool for the job that you're going to have to do anyway. Um, so pay always as much as you can. And this just is a, a general rule. This applies to more than just hardware. Um, this is, you know, has application across all of your purchasing from here on out. Get the right tools for the right job. Value what a tool can do for you. And uh, if you buy to those specifications, I think that on the flip side, you know, obviously don't pay for stuff you don't need, um, but do pay for the stuff that you do. <laughs> really, long, really long around, a long around way to say that, isn't it? <laughs> well, and not really. And it's interesting because it, it feeds into a couple of these next points, right? So one of the things that Malice is talking about is using the right tools. And the other is taking a look at managing all of the things that you create with those tools effectively. Um, one of the things you'll hear us talk about both in this and, and also in the tools section is the idea of consistency. It's incredibly important that with your storage and your organization systems, whether or not it be a post-it note system, a file folder system, a digital filing system, et cetera, that you establish one and you stick to it, that you do the same thing for how you file your emails, um, get very comfortable with folders. As Malice said, get very comfortable with subject lines. Because your world has moved to a slightly more digital context, it's important that you establish a system and that you stick to it. And that has to do with you know version control on files. It has to do with file naming conventions for anything that you send back and forth. Make sure that you establish a system and that you can maintain it consistently and without fail. And then that takes us to something we've been dancing around a little bit, which is about uh, the personal side of this, which is, you know, we, you are not just a digital human being, you are someone in real life. And a big part of working from home is about controlling your environment, and it's also establishing an environment. When you go to work, you have a desk, and you have, you know, sometimes pictures up of your kids or not. <laughs> you know, maybe you have your high heel collection, which I always did. You have whatever it is you like to keep around you in order to in order to you know have yourself well stocked those things are equally important at home earlier in this conversation um, you know, before everybody jumped on malice was talking about how she's got two separate workspaces at home one is a creative writing space and the other is a professional space for her to maintain her business trying to maintain a distinction between those spaces is important you don't need to necessarily have a space for creative pursuits or you know whatever it is and a workspace but if you're going to invest in working from home, you need to invest in having a space that's specifically dedicated to that. Mala shared an anecdote with us earlier about, you know, if you consistently work at the kitchen table, then it becomes blurred what you're supposed to do there. You're supposed to eat there. You can work at the kitchen table, but it's better to have a desk and to use that desk space to be able to be fully equipped to do what you do. If that means all of the ink for your printer, if it means well-sharpened pencils and the type of paper you like to use, if it means, to Malice's point, uh, you know, a computer set up for graphic design or one that's set up to be on the go, whatever your system is, make sure that you have a work environment that's dedicated, that it's pleasant, that, it's, you know, that it works for your purposes, and that it's well-stocked at all points. And I think it's important to, Leah, just jump in for a minute. I think it's important to point out that this doesn't have to be an entire room. Um, particularly if you're just starting out, you're not going to have a ton of money. So we're not talking about establishing a corner office where you can kick your feet up, and, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, but it really is just about those clear demarcations of space. So even if it's a corner, maintain your corner. That's your corner, you know. Indeed. Love it. <laughs> I love your corner. Love, love your corner. <laughs> um, the other component of this is about managing your image. We've talked a little bit about how people no longer see you, and so it's important to understand how the virtual you comes across. If you use any kind of you know, video system, such as Zoom, like we're using today, there's the ability to turn on the, uh, the video camera, which Malice and I decided not to do for this purpose, um, but to make sure that you use these tools effectively, that you are on time, that if you are going to be in front of the camera, that you make sure you find a place where you can place your computer where you feel like you represent yourself in the best way, whether or not it's good lighting, whether or not you touch up your makeup, whether or not you brush your hair, um, you know, however it is, if you're going to work with people remotely, you need to make sure that you think about how they're seeing you since they no longer have the ability to see you kind of moment to moment. 
And the other important thing, whether or not it's Zoom, whether or not it's the telephone, no matter what it is, is learn to love the mute button. Because you are at home, the doorbell may ring and your delivery food may come or the Amazon person may come or your dog may bark or your kids may cry or there may be you know, icicles falling outside your window lights happening to Lindsay. Whatever it is, if you're not the person speaking, learn to love the mute button because there can be a lot of background noise that creates disruption in conversation you don't quite understand. And it just makes a more harmonious environment. It also makes it less easy for people to peek into you know, behind the curtain that, oh my God, you're at home. Uh, bye, Sarah. Sorry, Sarah said that she needed to sign off, but uh, she, she sent through her thanks. Um, and I'm very, very quickly going to touch on uh, social media in this great big digital world and um, a level of professionalism. I think most of us are, are um, pretty used to this by now. Um, but if you're of our particular generation, so I forget what they call us, the Xenials. Xenials. Um, yeah, the ones who grew up without the, the advent of the personal computer, but have also had it in most of our adult lives. Um, so we remember a time before. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that can present its own, uh, its own challenges. So in the world of social media, as far as maintaining your professional image is concerned, it's always important to create se separate professional profiles or pages that, you, um, that are different from your personal ones. Um, I, I honestly cannot stress this enough. It seems like there will be a lot of crossover and it will seem like you're duplicating work. Um, but quite personally, those two things are always and should be separate um, as far as just your career and your aspirations are concerned until you get to such a point where your personal brand is in fact your professional, your professional profile, then, you know, that's, that's where that line starts to, starts to get a little hazy. Um, if you are allowed to work from home um, and you do happen to have friends or you have a public page that anybody can follow um, or your profile that anybody can follow, uh, don't post when you're supposed to be working <laughs> unless it's part of your job. I know that seems like a little bit of common sense, but you'd be surprised how often people get caught out that way. Um, choosing your medium wisely, uh, as we talked about com communications is really important in social too. Um, and part of that will be, you know, your level of comfortability, but also the type of audience that each, uh, social media outlet might potentially, um, tend to gravitate towards. Um, and also at the end of the day, it's really important to not friend every coworker or hiring manager or a uh, friend of a friend of a business contact on LinkedIn. Um, the numbers game is important, yes, uh, but unless you're a Kardashian at the end of the day, you're hiring man or you're a social media, you're applying for a social media manager job, the number of friends at the end of your name, um, isn't actually what's most important about your social media presence. So, uh, and that, that kind of leads a little bit into, to where we're going next. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little thing we call respect yourself so you don't wreck yourself and you'll start to see a theme obviously as you go through here Lee and I are both terrible children of the 90s um, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, you know just maintaining your professional self um, these are uh, tools uh, for making sure that you don't sort of wake up one day and find that you're three weeks behind everybody else or three months behind everybody else. So it's important to keep current, um, whether it's in your field or in a field of a client. Um, if you get a new client or you get on a new project and maybe it's in an industry or with a subject matter that you're um, not necessarily intimately familiar with, you definitely want to a at least bring yourself up to speed and have a layman's knowledge of of what that is, um, but also just in general, learning new subjects will be good for your overall professional growth. Um, if you are going to go into a conversation with a potential client, maybe ask your contact for or search their website for an org chart. Um, that's a little bit of professional stalking, but you'll seem really smart and with it when you finally get on the phone and you have, you don't have to ask who, um, every time they say something, or if they talk about their internal structure for their organization, you'll have at least a working knowledge and you'll be able to keep up. Um, 
and obviously being digitally savvy is is very 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 important um you know don't let your tech know-how inhibit your productivity um or your lack thereof so sometimes it can seem like it's just too hard to actually learn something digital or learn a new tool when in fact not learning it is actually going to cost you more time and money that said <laughs> here 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 so then that takes us into our next section, um, which is about the tools that help you achieve all of the things that we just talked about. Some of them we just discussed are kind of rules of the road and common sense, but there are a good number of platforms, of apps, et cetera, that can allow you to make the most of this digital existence and to collaborate best with others. So our categories here are stop, collaborate, and listen, <laughs> and then also keep it sassy. And those are our tools. And speaking of sassy tools, it was just an opportunity to show you vanilla ice. So with that, tools to manage your time. Mal, you want to take this one? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I was uh, I was getting caught up. I was reading a reading. I thought something came in. Um, so these are actual, like I said, hard and fast uh, tools that I've used or that uh, clients of mine have used, and so I've come to learn. Um, through the course of, of various projects. Um, and again, we encourage you that as we go through these things, if you've got something that you found that you really like or that works well for you, um, please do share in the chat window. Um, so the first thing is toggle. Uh, and I actually think I spelled that wrong. I, uh, terrible, terrible. Um, I don't think there's an E on it. It's just T-O-G-G-L dot com. Um, and that is a digital time clock. Um, and it gives you the ability to set up projects, to set up clients, to set up billing rates. Um, and then the key thing about it is, is that you can either start and stop. So the minute you open your email and start typing a response to somebody, you can hit start on that. And then the minute you stop, you can press stop. And even if it's only a minute and a half that it took you to do that, that time is logged. And over time, you'll start to see how much time you spend answering email or that kind of thing. You, we will also let you go in and manually enter it after the fact. So if you, you know, just spent the last three hours working on a problem or like you were looking for a piece of hidden code or whatever your, whatever your field or industry is, you can go in after the fact. Um, Time Camp and Clockify are also similar tools in that. They each have their own distinct features and their own user interfaces that people will either, you know, gravitate towards or not. Um, but those, those three I have found are, are incredibly useful. They're also pretty user friendly. Excellent. Um, another important part of this is not only managing your own time, but figuring out how to work with other people <laughs> and trying to communicate with them because they have their own calendars to keep. So some team management tools that are important. Um, Slack.com or Glip.com, which was formerly Ring Central, enable you to manage tasks, but more importantly, to you know create group channels where you can talk. Specific teams can come together or you can communicate with the organization at large. Tools like Monday.com and Microsoft Teams also enable you to do things like look at how work is assigned and do digital check-ins. And so the status of projects are available to you at all points. And you can take a look at who's working on what, what is the status of different elements inside of that, et cetera. So it gives you the ability, particularly as a remote worker, to stay in touch with people and in terms of status without having to schedule status meetings. Uh, Leah, just a, a little quick note. You were cutting out there, so maybe some small interference. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, and then <clears throat> I'm going to take this back over. Uh, in terms of project management tools, and this, uh, I find this comes in really handy for uh, us as, as a business <clears throat> working with multiple clients on different kinds of projects. Um, so there's a couple of them that are out there that you know, sort of have project management specifically as a goal. They have other features as well, um, but at their core, they are project management tools. The first is Basecamp, um, Trello.com. Uh, we actually use Freecamp. Freecamp is, uh, was built as a free version of Basecamp. Um, and then we found that it uh, far exceeded the features and the functionality of Basecamp. And they have a professional, um, 
sorry, it sounds like I'm proselytizing here. I don't mean to do that. Um, but, <laughs> and then Microsoft projects. Um, and the reason that you'll keep seeing Microsoft on here, I know a lot of people um, are, are Mac users, um, but Microsoft has uh, really made uh, strides in recent years to build um, a, a cross-platform suite of really useful tools to try and keep up with the, like Trello and Jira and things like that. Um, and also, uh, most people use a Microsoft Office suite even on a Mac these days. So, um, but they're not doing a very good job of telling you that they have all of these tools that are available. So, <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft Projects is another one of those. <laughs> And in terms of file management, you know, we've talked about maintaining excellent organization and to look at, um, you know, file naming conventions, filing conventions, et cetera. But in service of thinking about these different suites, for example, PowerPoint has evolved um, over the years to the point that it now has a collaborative feature. So does Keynote. And so you have the ability to store these files in the cloud and they operate very much like Google Docs. If you're working on a PowerPoint file or if you're working on an Excel file, you can have multiple user users edit them at the same time. So Google Docs is another standby, of course, um, where you can post documents online and have collaborative tool sharing, enable people, you know, multiple people to edit them and track changes together at the same time. Um, Dropbox is a great option for that same collaborative use and also for large file sharing. And then, you know, I think now it's back to the Microsoft conversation with, with OneDrive, um, if that's the system that, that you use. But any of these options give you the ability to have multiple people working on files at the same time so you can save yourself the time of sending things back and forth and getting into that version control nightmare. This is where buying to spec also comes into play. Um, for example, one of these uh, gives you a certain amount of storage and the other one will give you a terabyte of storage with your free subscription. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> look at the specs. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and then one of the other things that uh, we often, you know, it's better to show rather than tell, right? Um, and so depending on the kind of work that you do or the kind of people that you work with, um, a lot of the times just telling somebody what you're going to do or telling them how to do something is not enough. And so that's when screen sharing really becomes important um, or really useful. And there are a number of tools out there for that. Um, Skype, which a lot of people use uh, as their voice over IP or as their chat mechanisms, has a really great um, screen sharing fu functionality that's built into it. Uh, TeamViewer is another one. It offers both a free and a paid subscription. Um, Zoom, obviously, um, tends to be more for actual, you know, sort of conferences, but uh, it's pretty easy to set up a room if you need to share uh, something like that. Um, and then an alternative to Zoom is join.me, uh, which is actually my personal platform of preference for that. Um, and then the other thing that's not up here that I will mention, though, is screencasting or projecting your screen. Um, and the difference here would be when you, you know, you absolutely don't want anybody to necessarily change anything or you want to be pretty specific about um, what it is you're throwing up. Uh, certain tools in that regard are AirParrot. Uh, Chromecast is great for that, not just for streaming uh, YouTube videos. Uh, there's also a feature on your Kindle Fire Stick that will let you uh, screencast uh, your computer screen. Um, and then obviously most smartphones these days have an innate screencasting mechanism as well. And then back to time, I always come back to time. It's the only thing I think about really, but <laughs> a couple of things about the idea of calendar sharing tools. Not only is it important for you to maintain your own calendar, but if you have a team that you need to look at other people's calendars in order to do kind of group scheduling, great tools for this are of course Google, um, Microsoft and you know, in Outlook, um, Freedcamp, and then also Trello. We will pull the team's calendars together and be able to manage them simultaneously and set various levels of permission. So in some instances, you can share your calendar with someone, but not allow them to edit it so that they don't have the ability to see, you know, this is when you put in, take a shower, right? <laughs> they can just see block time. You can also give permission to see full details, but not change anything on it. Or you could give someone like an admin or a support, um, someone in the support role, the ability to edit your calendar um, and have that same capacity with other teammates. Regardless. Yeah, and just as a, as a follow-up to that, once you do pick a platform, uh, if you have control over it, stick to it. 
Um, if you find that something's not working for you, uh, you should really learn to make quick breaks. But you know, using one tool for one client or this tool for that client, if it's within your control, you're gonna find that you just end up wasting time managing the platform itself and not actually doing the work. So pick a platform, stick to it, learn it, love it, make it your friend. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna also take this one on because this is something that I've found incredibly useful for me. Um, these are tools that maybe you might not necessarily think about. Um, everybody has something different that works for them. Um, and it turns out that once you remove the structure of an office environment and you remove the people who can see over your shoulder and whether or not they're doing it, um, it becomes much, much harder to understand where you're wasting time or to know that, you know, to, uh, until the end of the month comes and you realize that you're not going to bill as much because you actually spend a lot of time just kind of doing other stuff, um, then you want to start to really get a handle on that. And so um, the first one, the first tool that I want to mention is called Rescue Time. Um, and what this does is this uh, tracks the time that you've spent on applications or websites. Um, so it kind of just runs in the background. It, it, it's a little, it sounds a little big brotherish, but it's really just for you. Um, and it produces reports. Um, it can send you email summaries at the end of the day of, of where you went and how much time you spent there. Um, it, you can set your own productivity levels and sort of score yourself against that. Um, so it's just a really great way to understand where your time goes. Um, the second one uh, is called Flipped, and uh, they market themselves as a digital wellness company, but it's basically rescue time specifically for your phone. Um, so if you find that you've got your computer open and you've got whatever you're working on there, but you're still looking down at your phone a bunch and like going on Facebook or whatever, um, it'll help you sort of capture that time or at least help you find ways where you can recapture that time. And then the final one is a, a service that's called Focus at Will. Uh, and this is actually a music service. Uh, and this is going to sound kind of hooey wooey, but it's based on hu human neuroscience. Um, and if you're like me, uh, I adore music. Music is kind of my lifeline. I was a DJ the full time at, at OZQ, the full time I was at Smith. Um, I can't really listen to music while I work because I, I don't want to work. I just want to stop and listen to the music. But I'm also one of those people that works really well when there's white noise or something in the background. Um, this, you can go in and create your own personal profile based on how you work, the kind of music that you like, um, what you find distracting and what you don't, that kind of thing. And this will actually create uh, music radio stations for you whose in sole goal is to, to boost your productivity. Um, and it can be anything. If you like rain or if you want something, you know, if you want whale noises in the back, uh, you can do that. But if you like EDM without words because you can just sort of tune it out and keep that steady thrum in the background, you can do that as well. Um, and I just, I've actually found it to be hugely useful. Leah will tell you, I normally keep Law & Order SVU on the background because I've seen it all so many times that I could recite every single thing. And so I don't really care what's happening. Um, but it's good for that to be there because in the back of my head, I know that something else is, is bigger than me, I guess. <laughs> And then our, our last point here is just um, looking at the idea of the gift and curse, curse of SAS. Curse? So, curse. The gift and curse of SAS. Okay. Which is software as a service, for those of you who do not know. And it is actually the wave of the future, very interestingly. Um, I do some work with some of the consultancy companies that are creating the future, which is in its way terrifying. But all these conversations about predictive analytics and artificial intelligence and robotics and all these things, but moving to a model where instead of people selling you things you can hold, instead of going to buy a product in a box, companies are moving towards selling software and that is the service that they provide. And so what you'll find is that there's a lot of this coming up and to Malice's point earlier, you know, pick, pick the right tools, look at, you know, buying things correctly in terms of the specs that you need, et cetera. But there is a little bit of a trap here when it comes to things like free trials and free subscriptions and auto renewals. So understand when you look at some of these tools that they are hugely useful, but, but mind 
the timeline. If you sign up for something with a free trial, set timelines in your calendar to make sure you understand how to unsubscribe. Um, if you've got unwanted subscriptions, figure out how to get unwanted subscriptions. Don't let those kind of drain the bank in the background. Um, to Malice's point, if you get a free trial, the renewal can come back at three, four times the expense. And so you'd want to make sure that if you're signing up for things, you know, that don't actually physically renew themselves, don't come to your hands, that you're keeping track of those. But the software as a service can be a tremendous advantage when it comes to maintaining most current versions of different platforms, like for example, the Adobe Creative Suite or the Office 365. Um, great ways to be able to keep your software up to speed and be able to renew it on demand, but you have to mind and make sure that you've got the right software that you need and that you're not carrying dead weight. And with that, thanks guys. That's all, that's all we got <laughs> to say about that. I know that we're up against time, but if anybody has any questions or other thoughts or suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Or read them, I should say. <laughs> Unless you want to raise your hand, I can unmute people. Thank you both so much. Nice, yeah, no work. nice work, gang. <laughs> All right, cool. This is great. I've had a lot of thank yous and greats. I love um, seeing everyone use the chat to comment. Um, oh, yeah. Some Alrighty. more thank yous. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and um, we'll share the presentation and the recording after. So look, stay tuned for that email. Uh, wish there was an easy trick to stay focused. I have that problem. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of tools out there um, that will help. You know, there's there's your personal focus, but there are also a lot of tools out there that will help minimize the distractions around you. So I know that like Mac has its dark screen mode, but there are also things that will literally make require you to enter a password before you switch out of a particular program. So if you just need to sit down and finish designing that brochure for someone or whatever it is, you know, you can you can force your computer to not let you go do those other things. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that being very helpful <laughs> in certain yeah. situations. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much for being here. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. All right. Cool, guys.